So you're very welcome to, as we continue our Lenten series of talks uh, here from St. Mary's. And I've been asked to, to speak this week on uh, grace and charity as friendship with God. And so we're going to talk about how we understand grace and what it actually is and how we receive it and what kind of effects it has in each of our lives. So there, as you, as you see the first kind of slide, the image there uh, with the, the topic of the, the talk, Grace and Charity is Friendship with God, you'll see a little quote uh, underneath uh, the, the title. And it's a quote from St. Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican from the 13th century. And St. Thomas, uh, when discussing grace, uh, has this to say. Grace is nothing other than a certain participation in the divine nature. Okay, so this gives us so much insight already to what grace is. Grace is a participation in God's very nature. He communicates himself uh, to each of us when he gives us his grace, his free gift of himself to each of us. And then we can go on later just to discussing uh, what types of grace we receive as human beings and the effects that they might have uh, in each of us as we, as we go through the talk. Um, just by way of alerting you, uh, the slide that we'll just, uh, the image that you'll see there coming up is a famous painting uh, from the artist Caravaggio, who was a, a famous painter in the 16th century. And this particular image um, is from 1599. And it's the calling of St. Matthew, the Apostle St. Matthew, who we know was a tax collector. But I won't go into it too much because at the end we will look in depth at this painting. But just to alert you already that in this painting we see how God's grace operates in the life of a human being and someone who was very pivotal and instrumental in the writing uh, of the gospel and the spreading of the faith in the early centuries. And so we can discuss that painting towards the end. So why should we speak about grace during Lent? You know, isn't this the time for where we actually decide what we're going to do for the Lord? What kind of penitential or spiritual practices that we are going to undergo, uh, giving up things or, or doing things that we do normally do in this period of Lent. And this can give us often the impression that it's our doing for God. And of course, as human beings and with free will, we do do things for the Lord. And we do uh, undertake these penances and practices uh, and so forth. But we can't lose sight of how God's grace is working in us already and how that grace moves us to accomplish these works. So it's not us doing these spiritual exercises alone and the Lord being a spectator on the sidelines, but more that he is with us, moving us, inspiring us, and we need to cooperate with the graces that he offers us. So a good insight into this, um, I remembered from the day of my ordination. And even though this is the prayer a bishop says on a priest's uh, ordination, it still refers to baptism also for all of us. So the bishop says to the priest on the day of his ordination, may the Lord who has begun this good work in you, bring it to its completion. And isn't this what the Lord has done for each of us, especially through baptism and our reception of the sacraments through our lives? Even if some of us have lapsed and are on the journey, on the way back to the faith, the Lord has begun the good work in you and in me. And the Lord brings it to completion and he asks us to cooperate with him in that work of bringing us to our end. And that end for every one of us is eternal life uh, with the Lord. So it's the Lord's grace that prompts us to acts in faith and devotion. And we'll talk about this later uh, in what some instances that we see as maybe coincidences or somebody coming back to the faith, when actually when we look behind it, we see the Lord's grace at work. So in this Lenten journey, we journey with the Lord, especially meditating on the 40 days and the 40 nights in the desert, but realizing that it is the Lord who is walking with us through our pilgrimage uh, through this life and that we're going to receive his graces at all times. He offers us his life and a participation in his nature. And what we want to do uh, in these weeks is cooperate with what the Lord is already doing in each one of us. So in our time together today, in these, uh, this short time, I'm going to do three things. We're going to talk about the, vac the actual nature of grace, what it is. We're going to talk about the different effects that grace has in our lives and how we distinguish different types of grace that we may receive. 
And then finally, we'll look at that painting uh, from Caravaggio to see how grace transformed uh, an individual uh, life. So the actual word grace at this point, um, I want you to think about what images it actually brings to your mind already before we even begin this kind of discussion. What do you think grace is? What image does it evoke uh, in your mind? Because it can be used to denote multiple things. Often you'll hear people say, well, it was a real grace for me to go to that place or to visit this particular particular place or, or he or she or this person has been a real grace to me. And even in the context of one of my family members, my niece, um, it can even denote a name who's called Grace, which means gift, obviously, as we'll go into later on. So this is what we, the kind of images already that we may have in our minds of what grace is. But let's actually talk about what the church teaches uh, about grace and what it actually is. So I don't know about you, um, but growing up and even in my 20s, when I thought of the word grace, I kind of thought it was like a, a spiritual top up, uh, something like a property, a material thing, something that we're given that tops us up spiritually inside. And when I played soccer in the past before I became a priest, I thought about this in, in light of what we used to do uh, as athletes would take supplements. We used to take protein powders and different performance enhancing supplements that would help our bodies perform at their highest potential. And therefore, do we think grace is like this on the spiritual level? Um, a thing, a supplement to our soul that helps our spiritual lives enhance and perform at the top of their ability. And although there is a certain likeness in this, and we, we can't stretch that analogy too far, there is a certain likeness in it. It's not really what grace is if we think about what St. Thomas has already said. A gra grace is participation in the very life of God, even though its effects may be resemble like the image I gave you there about a supplement that helps our soul grow spiritually in the love of God and so forth, but it doesn't fully grasp uh, what it actually is. So let's listen to what the Catechism says about grace, a short phrase in paragraph 996. Grace is favour, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God adoptive sons, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. So grace is favour, free, gift, undeserved. We don't merit it, we don't, we're not worthy of it, but God gives us uh, his helps. Why? So that we may respond to his call. He's already calling us to become his, his children, adoptive sons and daughters, and finally they're uh, in the Catechism, um, taking up that idea that St. Thomas formulated even before then, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. Each one of us is called to eternal life. So this is what grace is. It's a favour, a gift from God and a help from God, a communication of his life to each one of us. So if there's anything I really want you to grasp from this talk, it's this notion to try to move from this understanding um, of grace as, as something filling me up to grace as friendship with God, because it gives birth to charity and charity is friendship with God. So God communicates his life to us and we are joined with God in this sense. So it's a sense of friendship uh, with the Lord, even though it's, it's a spiritual help and it helps us perform certain actions and so forth, because God is communicating his very life to each of us. Now, when we think of the sacraments, this is very obvious. God communicating himself to us, and especially when we think of the Eucharist. Christ himself, in his totality, gives himself fully to each of us in our souls when we receive Holy Communion. And what we do is dispose ourselves to make as best as possible that we're worthy recipients of that grace of the Lord's presence within, of, within us that's begun at baptism. And so this is why grace is not something that we can produce ourselves. It's not something that we can achieve merely by human effort alone. It's God's gift to us. We merely dispose ourselves to receiving 
uh, the gift. So this is about participation. So this notion of participation, let us bring it down for a moment. We participate in many things. So many of us, uh, whether it be at a soccer match, rugby or a GAA match, or even going to a concert listening to our favourite musicians, we participate in that match or that game or in that concert by being there and listening or uh, being present at this particular event. But this is very different to our understanding of grace because while we're present at these events, we're not in communion with those who are the principal actors in this event. At a soccer match or a GA match or a rugby match or a concert, you're a spectator and you're cheering on your team. So you're participating, but you're not in communion with those who are the principal actors in the game. So participation in the spiritual sense that we're talking about here is very different. You're actually in communion with God. He's giving his life to you and to me. And so this participation is much deeper. And so therefore this is a gift uh, as well, through, especially through the Holy Spirit in the sacraments especially, that makes us become like God. Okay, so secondly, if grace is a participation in God's life, then the purpose of that is to make us become like God. But this is beyond our capacity to achieve. So God has to give us a help. He has to give us a created power to enable us to become like him because we can't do it alone. It's so far above us and beyond us. But this grace enables us, as St. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Or I can do all things through the Lord who gives me strength. Okay, so both and our free will cooperating uh, with the Lord. So the purpose of grace, as we say there, is to become like God. And I was thinking as well to give a, a sporting analogy. Um, when I played soccer, one of the famous mantras of the coaches and the managers was, uh, especially when they get very animated, I want you to fulfill your potential. The reason why I'm being harsh on you or pushing you is that I want you to fulfill your potential. And so when we transpose this to the spiritual life, this is what the Lord is asking of each of us, and especially during this Lent, I want you to become the person that you were created to be, that I created you to be. And not only that, not that I just want it, the Lord says to us, but I will actually give you the grace, the help to become that person, to fulfill that potential. And so the Lord communicates his life uh, to each of us to enable us to do that. So, okay, so at this moment, we'll talk uh, a little bit about the types of grace that we receive. And we use our human language to distinguish these different types of grace. But again, they're all a communication of God's life to us, but the effects can be different in our souls. So different types of grace. The first one I would like to focus on is sanctifying grace or habitual grace, it's called. Sanctifying, so the clue is already in the word. Sanctify means to make holy and habitual means that it's permanent and it's a stable disposition. Uh, and this is what sanctifying grace is for each of us. To say that a person is in a state of grace or sanctifying grace is that they're in a permanent, stable condition, a disposition to receive God's grace that makes them holy. And this is what happens again through baptism. This is what happens when we're properly disposed to receive the sacraments. We are being made holy and made like unto God. This is what God's sanctifying grace does to us. He inhabits our souls as in a temple. He takes up dwelling in our souls and takes pleasure in this person. And they're made holy through God's presence uh, in each of them. So this is what sanctifying grace is, to be made holy and pleasing uh, to God. And this sanctifying grace is not a one-off reality. It not just happens at baptism and that's it. Every time we receive the sacraments and we're properly disposed, we are being made more holy, more like God, and we grow in our capacity to receive more grace in that sense, more friendship with God, more of a communication uh, with his very life. And this increases in our soul. And how this kind of can be dis diminished or uh, in many ways is through grave sin. In this sense, when we grave sinly, uh, when we, when we uh, gratefully sin, 
we uh, kind of lose this state or this permanent condition of sanctifying grace or friendship with God. And, um, and we are wounded and therefore the sacraments then go on to help us in this. Okay, so how is this distinguished from actual grace? Uh, sanctifying grace, making us holy. Now we're going to talk about actual grace. And again, the clue is in the word. The actual grace is the grace that we're giving to act, to perform a particular action. And so like this, it's given to us to, by God, a communication of his nature to inspire us to acts of faith and devotion, and especially regards to things due to our concerning our salvation. So let's take an example which could really help. You're at home with your kids and you're doing normal everyday things. And then all of a sudden you feel this desire to pray or this desire that moves you to go to your room and pray. We may think that's just an idea that came to us, but that is the Lord could be communicating an actual grace, an inspiration to make an act of devotion. And our free will can either cooperate with that or reject it. Again, studying for an exam and you're struggling with a particular question and all of a sudden you have that moment of insight where you prayed beforehand and all of a sudden an answer comes to you from nowhere. That could be the Lord inspiring you with an insight, uh, uh, illuminating your mind. And again, this is an, an actual grace, could be an actual grace. And then finally, um, something that I've experienced as a priest particularly, and I've heard from people, somebody has been away from the faith for a long time and one day they didn't make a conscious decision to go to church but they just went out for a walk and they walked past a church and they noticed the doors were open and they just thought to themselves, Asher, I'll go into the church and I'll say a prayer. And while they were in the church they saw a light on in the corner and a priest hearing confessions and without much de deliberation they just felt, sure it's been a long time and maybe I have a lot of things on my conscience and they just go in there and that experience uh, in confession became liberating and was a, 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 a kickstart once again to their relationship with God. They were brought back into communion with God and at leaving the church they may think well sure I just made that was very coincidental wasn't it I just made those decisions to go out for a walk but that could be God giving this person an actual grace moving them to go into the church then moving them to go to confession and so forth. And you see here, our free will has to cooperate with this grace. The Lord offers and moves and prompts, but the actual grace doesn't perform the action itself. We need to cooperate with God's grace uh, to move us uh, to do this. And then just finally, um, a, a good story that I heard that really emphasizes uh, this notion of actual grace that then led to a person becoming in a state of sanctifying grace and then discovering uh, their vocation, was a homily given by the Archbishop of Paris. Um, uh, in, in, he was Archbishop of Paris between 1981 and 2005, Archbishop Jean-Marie Lutiger. And he gave a homily one day and he told the story to the congregation, um, a story uh, which was kind of situated back in 1931. And he told the story of three boys who were outside Notre Dame Cathedral and they decided to play a practical joke and one of the boys was a Jewish boy named Aaron and the three boys decided let's go into the church and we'll go into the confession box and we'll make a mockery of the sacrament and we'll make up some sins and this young Jewish boy Aaron decided I'll do that and he went in and the priest was hearing confessions and he went into the confession box and he sat down and he made up all these terrible sins as a joke and the priest I think halfway through this uh, perceived that this was a mockery of the sacrament and he said to the young boy at the end as a penance I want you to go to the to the the foot of the sanctuary where the big crucifix stands above the altar and I want you to say three times Lord Jesus I know that you died for me but I don't give a damn and the young boy laughed and left the confession box and said he would do it and thought sure that's easy I'll just go and do that and he walked to the foot of the altar and in front of the crucifix he looked at it and said Lord Jesus I know you died for me but I don't give a damn and then second he said Lord Jesus I know you died for me and I don't give a damn and his voice became more silent and then the third time he said 
Lord Jesus, I know that you died for me and I don't give. And he couldn't finish his sentence. He burst into tears. That was a communication of the grace of Christ coming from into the soul of this young boy, Jewish boy, Aaron. And he burst into tears because he looked at the crucifix and he realised how much the Lord loved him. And the Archbishop told the story that this young boy was baptised a, a Catholic a year later. And then later on, towards the end of his homily, he turned to the congregation and said, that young boy, Aaron, was me, the Archbishop himself, who later became a priest and then the Archbishop of Paris. And that's how the Lord's grace works in each of our lives. It works, it moves us and prompts us to act, especially in the areas of faith and devotion, the Lord calling us back to himself. And that actual grace, if we respond, leads us to partake of the sacraments, the very life of God himself, and we are made holy, we become like God, and we journey more deeply into the life of God, who is our ultimate happiness and our fulfilment. So let's just recap before we finish. Grace is a participation in God's nature. When we receive that grace, it can do a number of things. Sanctifying grace makes us holy. It's habitual, it's stable. We live in a state of grace, we may have heard. Actual grace, God can communicate to any person and God gives sufficient and actual graces to every human being because as we, heard, we read in the scriptures, God wills that all people will be saved. And our human free will needs to respond to that grace that the Lord is offering us at all times. And so kind of let's just finish now uh, for a couple of minutes by looking at our picture of Car from Caravaggio as we did at the beginning. Because this picture really illustrates uh, how grace comes through the Lord and strikes a human person and how their life can be totally changed. So if you look at the painting, which is in the church of St. Louis of France in Rome, it's the calling of St. Matthew. Let me ask you a few questions. What's the first thing that strikes you as you see this image here um, uh, on the screen? Is it the sunlight bursting through the window? You see it above the Lord there, coming through the window, illuminating the room. Is it the figure of Jesus standing tall, pointing towards Matthew? What about the clothes of those who are gathered around the table? Do you notice anything about the clothes of those, what they're wearing. And even though there's some debate about which person here in this story is actually Matthew, notice how Jesus is pointing. Look at his hand and his finger. Does it remind you of anything? Does it remind anyone, if you've seen before, of the famous painting in the Sistine Chapel from Michelangelo of um, the creation of Adam where you see God the Father pointing like this with his finger uh, at Adam and Adam's finger joining itself to the finger of the Father. Adam being recreated, um, being infused in many ways with a spiritual soul, a new creation. Look at the way Jesus points with his finger at Matthew and the reminiscent of Michelangelo's painting. That's not an accident from the artist. So the Lord is calling Matthew, pointing Leave behind the old life. Leave behind the obstacles that are stopping you from coming to me. Come and follow me. And this is what he's doing in this picture. And look at the sunlight above shining through. This is, depicts what grace is. Grace comes through Christ's humanity and, and the image here of the sunlight and strikes Matthew there as he sits at the table. And this grace comes to all of us especially if we think about it during this Lent. The Lord is pointing at you and at me. Come follow me. Come to me. It's not a one-off thing. It's every single day, that grace of conversion. And then finally, if you look at the figure who seems to be hugging the Lord in the picture, and this figure is Saint Peter. It's not very obvious, but Saint Peter is clutching the Lord. And this signifies that grace all grace, participation in God, 
in his very life comes through Jesus, comes through Christ. And because Christ gave authority to Peter and the successor of Peter, successors the popes, grace comes through his body, the church, as Peter signifies here, the church. So where do we find with certainty the communication of the very life of God in the sacraments of the church? So brothers and sisters, let's not waste any of these opportunities. Let's ask ourselves, where is God calling you? And what way is the Lord calling you this Lent? To leave behind the old person, the old habits, the vices, the sins that cling so easily. He's pointing at you and to me. Come to me and come to me in a way through my body, through the church, through my sacraments that I have given to the church to communicate my grace, my divine life to your soul, that you become like God and become like me. And so wherever the servant the master is, the servant is also, that we become Christ-like. So maybe as we finish this talk, we think about these things. Where is the Lord pointing at you at this time during Lent? And is he calling each of us in this way to become more and more fully his disciples? And where do you need to open yourself more and more to his grace uh, in this Lenten period? And so we ask him for this special gift, this special grace, this Lent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.